starting. All right. And then this and that. And we can start. All right, ready to roll? Uh, yeah. Perfect. And let's see if we're live. And we're live. Fantastic. I see the numbers going up. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, Ian. Thank you for doing this. And um, we'll wait a couple more minutes for uh, people to roll in. The usual. I'm Luca, your host of Platform Engineers. Um, uh, the usual stuff, um, housekeeping rules. So the session is being recorded right now. We'll share it tomorrow with you per email. Um, so don't worry about taking notes or anything. Um, Ian will do a 20, 30 minutes session. Um, uh, we'll go over demoing a um, couple of open source tools and, um, and then we'll open up the Q&A. Um, however, if you have any questions as we go through things, feel free to drop them in the, either in the chat, which by the way, you can use right now to tell us where you're joining from. That's always nice. Um, or um, the, the Q&A uh, little widget that you have on your bottom right, you can also use that. Um, in fact, um, if you want to use the Q&A, that's better um, because that you know, tends to be more organized for us to answer your questions. Um, we can get started. Um, just one last thing. Um, as most of you know, PlatformCon is almost around the corner. Um, I was at KubeCon last week. Um, maybe some of you were too. Um, and uh, the, 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 the conference energy is definitely there. So, um, and, and a lot of people that were there will also be at PlatformCon. So, um, you know, always, um, always great if, if people can make it. Again, as it's full of virtual event, is, uh, it's completely free. And we are doing a last update to the lineup and to the full schedule this week um, and, um, and send an email um, about that later on. Um, but I think we can get started, Ian, over to you. I'll shut up, I'll disappear. And again, if anyone has questions, drop them in. We'll, we'll try to get them as we go through. Ian, stage is yours. Awesome. All right, everybody. Uh, I figured instead of showing you a bunch of boring uh, PowerPoint slides, we would just go all demo most of this talk and then, uh, then follow it up with Q&A, which I'm sure you guys have uh, quite a bit of, uh, of questions. So, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, I'll, uh, I'll, let me just show you these sites real quick first. So um, the, the tools that I'm gonna be demoing here are uh, two of them. They're both open source. One's called Ops. This is a, um, a unikernel build slash orchestration tool, but not orchestration in, uh, in the vein of Kubernetes, we'll, we'll get into that. The other one is called Nanos. Um, this is the actual kernel implementation. Uh, and so uh, these are both on GitHub uh, as well. Uh, so you, you can download, freely use it. And uh, we'll go ahead and jump into the actual demo part. Uh, all right, so I uh, hope everybody can see my screen here. Um, Yep. What we're going to do is we're going to show uh, uh, maybe a JavaScript demo and then maybe a Go web server. So uh, if we look at this hi.js here, you'll recognize this is a very simple um, hello world uh, JavaScript server. Just listens on port 8083, says hi. Um, if we kind of pull up our command here, what we can do is run ops package load, Iber node. 14.2.0.8083, and we'll just pass it this file. And what happens is, um, if it if you don't have the uh, the package, Ops will go ahead and download the uh, the Node package, and you can see that it's already kind of booted up here. Um, and in this other window, you know, uh, we can see our request coming in. Um, but we 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 bundle these packages uh, and server them up on uh, repo dot ops dot city. And these are kind of like pre-made, um, you know, the, the, the equivalent of them are kind of like Debian packages, uh, so to speak. And so they're just tarballs with a root file system and then whatever is necessary. 
Uh, and so, so you can use that for Python, Ruby, Node, um, or, you know, in cases like databases, you have like MySQL, MongoDB, Redis, all, all this good stuff. Um, and uh, show you kind of what the size of this image actually was. Um, this one's slightly bigger because it's clocking in at 87 megs. And so to, to kind of um, compare and contrast to a container or a normal Linux VM, um, this image, if we just kind of do a file on it, uh, you can kind of see that it's an actual disk image, right? It's not a container. It's not you know um, Linux or anything. This is an actual disk image. You can take this, you can upload it to Amazon, Google, uh, Azure, you know, any of the uh, public clouds out there, and it just kind of works out the box. Um, we can go ahead and look at this other one. Now, this is a Go web server. Um, same sort of deal, just listens on 8080. Uh, if you look at this, what I did was I cross compiled it to, to Linux using the Goose Linux um, uh, syntax. And uh, I do that because. Nanos operates on ELF binaries. So ELF is the native uh, Linux binary format. And the reason we do that is because we want to be able to uh, run pretty much any Linux application that you're going to try. As you can tell, I'm on a Mac right now, um, but, uh, but this allows you to effectively run whatever Linux application you want on a Mac as well. Uh, so, so, so we have our file, right? Um, I'll go ahead and show you this config JSON because I'm going to show you how we actually run this on Google. Uh, so with config JSON, we give it a bucket name, this nanos test. Uh, and this basically is a temporary holding location for when you upload your images and before we create machine images out of them. And then I've said, hey, I want it to listen on uh, port 8080. Um, we look at build. Obviously, this is just how I'm building it. You know, uh, I turn off the Go 11 modules just because I've been using Go for, for quite a long time. So I'm not really uh, used to it. And then um, we can create an image, right? So this is exactly how we actually create the image. Um, you can see that I've exported my credentials file to this gcloud JSON um, file. And so this is my Google credentials to interact uh, as a service account. And since I've already been playing around with this, uh, the first thing I'm going to do is to delete the image. You can see that I'm spinning it up in California, which is where I'm based. And so it's uh, relatively fast, uh, just US West 2. Um, my, my project, which is kind of, kind of sensitive, but you know, whatever. And then uh, the image creation. So let's go ahead and create the image. Um, it's going to ask me to delete this. I say yes. Um, obviously, if if you don't have the image, then it's uh, not going to ask you. Uh, but uh, all right, so it's it, it went ahead and deleted the the old image that I had, and it's doing a new one. And just to clarify, uh, if you were putting this in Jenkins or some other CI/CD pipeline, uh, every time you hit that deploy button, we're actually going to upload a brand new machine image uh, that that you can deploy. And so it's um. You know, every single deploy, brand new image. In the case of Amazon, you're you're literally getting like a new AMI every single time you deploy it. And we've we put little tags on these things so you can um, track them. We know that they're made by ops, and so so you can see that the uh, image was made. Um, I'm going to go ahead and show you this list image uh, command. I've I've put them in shell scripts just because I don't want to type all this and. I don't remember the syntax half the time, but if we do list image, it's just ops image list and then all this other stuff. And if you don't like flags, you could put this in config too. Uh, but you can see that we have quite a few different um, images that I've been creating and sometimes I just don't delete these, right? All right, so next up we have our image. It's sitting on Google. Uh, what we wanna do is create an instance, right? So same sort of thing, instance create. This is a lot faster because the image is already stored on Google. It's already being uh, put there. And then um, this, will, uh, this will pull over and we'll grab the IP. All right, so the instance has been made. That's great. Uh, I'll show you the list inst command. So this basically says, hey, show me what instances are there, right? So show this. 
All right, so now we have uh, the images and we see this G165 whatever uh, name because I'm, I'm so great at naming, right? Um, and here's our public IP. So if we do a curl on that guy, uh, 8080, and you can see that the instance is live uh, on Google, right? And so, you know, just to clarify, this, this image is not running Linux. There is no Linux whatsoever inside, inside this instance. There's no Kubernetes, there's none of that. It's literally just your application. Uh, if you want, we can even do ops image tree. Um, I believe this is correct in syntax. All right, so this is the actual file system of the image that we created. Um, you can see this proc. Uh, these are what we call pseudo files in here. Uh, we do not have the dumpster fire that is proc in Linux because it's a dumpster fire. <laughs> so, uh, but, but there are certain things that certain programs do want from proc. Uh, unfortunately, it's not so cross-platform anymore. And so uh, there's a couple of instances where we'll enable things in proc. Uh, and then you see libin and SS. Um, this gets kind of packaged with everything. Go honestly doesn't necessarily need this but pretty much everybody else will want it. Uh, and, and so ops just kind of goes ahead and puts it in there. We might change that later on. You might see this thing, uh, Etsy password, and you're like, wait a minute, I thought uh, union kernels don't have users and you're correct. <laughs> because uh, what we do is uh, the, uh, again, many programs will want um, some sort of value of some kind to, to show up, otherwise certain functions just flat out don't work, but it's, it's a stub, it doesn't do anything. Um, and so don't, don't expect it to do anything either. Uh, obviously resolve.conf if you wanna make DNS requests and then our, our certs as well for outgoing requests. So, so that's all of um, that. And then, uh, but so, so, so that's, a, that's pretty much, you know, kind of, kind of what it, uh, is all about. It's it's pretty pretty basic. If we want to see this image size, so you can see this was a lot smaller than the node one. This is twenty megs, and so again, this is um, the entire virtual machine size. You know, if you have your own hardware, you can spin up hundreds or thousands of these, depending on resources. When we deploy to Google, uh, the minimum VM size is actually one gigabyte. So even though it's nineteen megs on on the laptop. On Google, it'll end up being one gig because uh, because that's the minimum. Sa same thing on Amazon. Uh, they uh, they didn't like really build it for you girls, but the good thing is is that uh, you only have to upload the twenty megs and not the not the one gig. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess that's all I had to show for demo, and I'm happy to kind of jump in and take any questions from uh, from Q and A as they exist. Awesome, thanks, Ian. Ian, sorry. Um, yeah, um, no, that was great. And in fact, I see the the participants' number just went up, not just stay there. So it's really good. Um, yeah, guys, any questions? Anything that you want to drop in? You know, one one thing I'll uh, I'll go ahead and share because I forgot to share uh, was the uh, wanted to show you what the actual logs look like there. Now, let me do this first. So if we do ops instance logs, um, we need to figure out our instance name first. All right, so it's this guy. Uh, ops. I believe this will do it. All right, so this is actually what the serial console is outputting from the uh, the instance running on Google. You can see our BIOS line, uh, RAM, the the CPU. So this this was just like a T two, uh, not a T two, sorry, a, a G one small, which I think is kind of the default size. Um, and so all of this is Google information. Uh, oh, sorry. All of this from CBIOS on up is Google information. And then this part is just Nanos stuff here. 
And so if you do like a, in this example, if you did a pump print out, um, it would wind up in there. Uh, for actual production deploys, you're gonna want to shoot it to like Elasticsearch or Splunk or you know whatever logging daemon you actually have set up. Uh, so I see some chat and some Q&A coming in. So Pete asks, with Go, we often just launch the binary in a from scratch container. When would it make sense to use a unikernel instead of the approach we're using? Um, so, so yeah, there's there's lots of different reasons um, uh, that uh, that and Go is actually a great great language for unikernels, by the way. Um, it, but uh, with the Go web server that I just showed you, this you know uh, this web server. We can uh, run this on Google. Um, we can get about 200% uh, faster uh, or as many more requests per second as the exact same Go application can on the same size of instance type of, of Debian on Google. Uh, so if you're running in a container, you're automatically going to be taking a performance hit um, versus just a normal Debian or Ubuntu instance. Uh, and so not only are we not getting that performance penalty, but we actually get run it a lot faster. Uh, and, and the main reason is because of context switching, right? Uh, depending on the context, there's, there's four different context types that you can, you can run into, right? There's, a, there's kernel to user level, there's um, process to process, there's thread to thread. They all have different performance um, penalties. Um, and uh, we've, we've gotten rid of three of them, but we do keep the kernel to user uh, simply for security reasons. Um, so performance is a is a huge benefit compared to containers, uh, but security is also another huge benefit. As I mentioned, there's no users. You can't actually like log into this. I don't know if any of you guys were running like inmap against that instance, but you know, check it out. You know, <laughs> uh, and and you'll find there's there's really nothing there at all. Um, it, there's no shells. You can't you can't run other programs in it. Uh, if you find a weakness or a vulnerability in a piece of software, we're not doing anything magical, but basically we make you work for your ex exploit payload. Uh, it, you know, you have to rely on things like ROP gadgets. And frankly, I've, I've never seen like my SQL dump written in pure ROP. So, so that's kind of at the level of difficulty there. Uh, but yeah, security performance and then ease of, ease of use is another thing. As you saw, two commands gets you up and running on Google. Uh, and there's really no work. Like I did no work to orchestrate the networking or the storage or any of that. I pushed all of that back onto Google and Amazon and it's not using proprietary uh, cloud offerings, right? It's the basics, the VM, the network, all that good stuff. Uh, so that's, that's the three main benefits that most people see. Uh, sorry, I, I can't pronounce your name, uh, uh, Gris, Gris, Grigors. Sorry, I totally butchered it. Um, but what do you see for C, this type of workloads Excel at when it's time to look at unikernels if you're already heavy on containers? Yeah, it, it depends. Um, I, think, I think a lot of people, again, uh, security performance and ease of use are kind of the three main things that they're looking at. Some people at scale, uh, costs start to become a real consideration uh, simply because, you know, us being software engineers, we like to geek out on performance, but um, it, you know, your CFO likes to geek, geek out on less money being spent on infrastructure, uh, which, which performance does at scale. So, so that's, uh, that's another kind of reason there. Uh, SA says, can you talk about number of CVEs found and fixed over a year for this stack compared to a larger general purpose OS? So this is an interesting question. And as of, uh, just last Saturday, um, there was a talk, uh, I forgot where, so, so, somewhere in Germany, um, by a guy who was working on his master's thesis, and he didn't file a CVE for this uh, for this issue that he found, but he did find um, the uh, the entropy on the uh, stack canaries were was off, and so that's something that is not a exploitable condition in of itself by uh, alone, but it is an issue that we needed to go in and fix. Um, and we were able to, to fix. As far as I know, there, there haven't been any CVEs filed uh, for, for uh, nanos in particular and unikernels at large. There was a paper, there's like a hundred page paper <laughs> by NCC group released back in like 2018, 2019. And they addressed a lot of 
um, problems that uh, kind of some of the uh, older generations of unikernels had. Things like they weren't enabling ASLR or they weren't doing stack canaries or they weren't doing write or execute. They weren't doing a lot of the things that you would find normally in Linux. Um, and, uh, you know, those are all things that Nanos address, uh, addresses. So, uh, so, you know, there's no reason why you can't have kind of the same sort of stuff. As for people just like coming through the code base, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you have Linux clocking in at 30 million lines of code um, over the course of the past 30 years. Uh, so, so while it's a massive code base, it also has had time for lots of people to kind of stick their eyeballs at. But, you know, if we go back a year, what was it, two years ago, where those guys, uh, those quote researchers were putting in um, exploitable code to the, to the Linux kernel just to see if people would catch it. And after a while, you know, people did catch it, but only after they got like quite a few um, problematic bits of code in. So <clears throat> there's an argument as to whether or not, you know, more eyeballs actually does lead to better security. After all, Linux and Nanos, I mean, they're both open source, but you have to have people who are actively hunting it down. So, and that number, I don't think is as large as people make it out to be. Um, so ER asks how to trace such applications without being able to connect to a container. So great question. And there's lots of different ways that you can kind of um, address this. Uh, so let me show you another thing real quick. Um, I still got my demo uh, thing open. So we have this thing called dash trace and I'll just show you the output. So you can see this is the equivalent of S trace. And so, uh, and I'm on a different computer. So my, my key bindings are all whacked. Um, but essentially, um, you can see the same sort of output that the S trace will give you. And we have, we have um, things like F trace too, where we can do performance uh, profiling. You know, we can do flame graphs of, of heap growth and figure out where it goes and all that good stuff. Um, a lot of your favorite APM tools uh, work out of the box. So Datadog, New Relic, and Prometheus, you know, just kind of works out of the box. Um, NanoVMs has, has a service called Radar. Uh, which is a paid service, but that also, you know, does things like memory growth and crash dumping and um, all that good stuff. One really interesting thing you can do with unikernels, and we don't have time to show you today, but you can actually, uh, you know, have something like MySQL running on Google as a unikernel, which we do, and uh, you can you can clone that in real time without touching the production database. And then you can download that and you can immediately attach GDB to it, uh, you know, if, if there's a problem going on and you can start, you know, jumping in and figuring out exactly what line of code and it, everything is, is uh, having an issue. So that's, that's actually one kind of cool feature that you literally can't do on something like Linux because of course, Linux is meant to run many, many different programs. Um, so David asked, like any other bare instances, EC2, you get zero orchestration service discovery. So you have to DY all of that. It sounds like, how do you add additional processes? All right, so a couple of questions here. But one, as, as I showed you, um, the orchestration, if you're coming from like Kubernetes world, all that orchestration stuff is not necessary in unikernel land because um, it, as I showed you with, with the Go instance, um, I, I said, hey, give it a public IP, but I didn't, I didn't have to stand up the taps and the bridges and everything else. That's something that Google did for me. And it wasn't even, it wasn't even a custom service that they had. It's just the normal virtualization stack that we're using. And so a lot of that orchestration software just goes completely out the window. Um, it's not something you have to mess with anymore. If you want to, and you have your own servers, you're more than welcome to shoot yourself in the foot with it. But uh, I would only do that if, if, you're, if you have a solid, large engineering organization that can dedicate the time for it. Um, it's it's uh, more work than I think a lot of people you know, uh, want, want, want to think it is. I mean, if you're, if you're running two or three services, just use the public cloud. It, it, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, as, as for the other question, if you want to run multiple processes, 
essentially unikernels, that's a defining characteristic of them is that they're single process to begin with. They're only going to run uh, one, one process. They literally, we don't have the code to actually run other processes. So, so that's an that's a architectural thing. If you want to run more, like say you have a web server and you have the database, you spin up two instances and they talk to, talk to each other over the network, which is great because that's how modern applications work anyways. Uh, just says uh, how the network stack is managed inside a unikernel image. Is it possible to use different drivers for specific network cards, Intel, Mellanox? So yes, it is, uh, it is possible to use different drivers, um, although it's, uh, it, that's, that's something that, so, so Nanos uses a, um, a fork of LWIP. So we've, we've made many, many changes to the LWIP networking stack. We added IPv6, uh, DHCPv6, so you could do uh, v6 uh, DHCP on, on Amazon, for instance, we added, uh, what was it? Um, there was a, there's, there was an actual security issue with LWIP too that we fixed and I, it, it's escaping my mind what, what we actually ended up fixing there. Um, but, uh, but, but we've, we've made like quite a, quite a few changes to where it's, it's pretty different now. Uh, you're welcome to kind of bring your own driver and your own stack, but at the end of the day, um, we'll use whatever the hypervisor is using. So Google has its own networking driver. Amazon has theirs. Uh, Azure has theirs. And it, it's really dependent upon the hypervisor of choice. Um, you're more than welcome to hack out your own if, if you need to. Uh, Vinay asks, does the standard scan tools can be used to scan these? So Vinay, I, I assume you're talking about things like um, you know, the stack and dynamic analysis, security tools, the uh, software supply chain tools. I assume that's what you're asking about. Um, you can. So, uh, you know, in your CI CD pipeline, if you're using something like Sonar or something like that, yeah, you can totally keep using that. Uh, you know, some of the runtime stuff, obviously those would need to have um, custom agents. And it's, it's a little bit of an advanced topic for this demo, but we have this concept called Calibs. And you can, you can basically, um, you can envision them as plugins to the kernel. So, so one example is a uh, syslog. So, you, you know, as I've mentioned before, uh, unikernels are single process, but what we've done is we've added this kind of plugin concept because usually when people, you know, want to add functionality to multiple different applications, especially if they're in different languages, like, like you have stuff in Go and you have stuff in Java and you have stuff in Python, you don't want to have to have a custom solution for each code. You just want to say, hey, take this, this functionality and apply it across all, all my infrastructure. And so that's where Caleb's um, come into play quite a bit. And so that's, that's how you can add that sort of functionality. Sometimes these things, uh, the common software that you might be using today, that might not exist, but it can easily be added. Um, Carmen asks, when we want to adapt the existing application, that is actually running on the cloud. How is it actually doing it to improve the performance of the program? Loading it into so, so essentially, what we're doing here is we're not we're not waving any magic wands. We're we're, we're not like optimizing your application, uh, so to speak. What we're really doing is optimizing the the guest. So when you're running in the cloud, you actually have two layers of Linux that you're using, right? You have you have the host, which is the cloud itself. Uh, so whenever you hear the cloud, just think that it's virtualization with an API, right? So, you know, whether uh, Google's built on KVM, Amazon used to be solely Zen, now they have a KVM fork they call Nitro, which does some offloading and so forth. Um, but, uh, but it's all virtualization. It's, it's all virtualization. And so um, essentially what we've done is, you, you know, in the past, we'd spin up a Debian or Ubuntu or, you know, a free BSD or whatever VM as the guest layer. And what we're saying is, is that it doesn't really make a lot of sense anymore to be managing both the application and that guest OS at scale. You know, if, if you're running like even 10 or 20 instances, you're, you're still managing a lot of that stuff. And, you know, as somebody who's had to fight the, uh, the server fires at two o'clock in the morning and pager duty, ringing you up and all this stuff, it's just, 
it's just gotten to the point where we're consuming way too much software nowadays. Even the smallest companies consume way too much software. And it, it doesn't make sense to us to be managing that, that guest layer anymore, not when we're already on the cloud. And so by shaving off a lot of that stuff, we get massive performance boosts um, from it. To give you an example, uh, if I go boot up a Debian instance on Amazon, uh, without me even installing a single thing, there's like a hundred uh, programs all running. And if it's a T2 small, that's one thread that all 100 of those programs are fighting over. They're all context switching back and forth, back and forth to, to share that one thread of resource. And that's, uh, that's, that's very um, costly. And it's just something that we as engineers have, have dealt with. And, and we're like, well, that's all there is. What we're saying is that's not what all, all there is. You know, uh, unikernels do provide um, uh, a different way of doing that because it's virtualized. Uh, David asks, so you have to build everything into the application stack, system level, collection log, shipping application level, monitoring, service discovery, registration. Uh, and then it sounds like the Caleb process is the answer here. That's how you would run common shared code. Yes, uh, David, that's correct. Um, so essentially, uh, you have your application. And by default, all we're going to do is load up that application. We're not going to include anything else because uh, some people might want, you know, this particular log uh, uh, agent. Uh, other people might want to use this type of APM agent. Somebody else might want to use, you know, um, some service mesh stuff. Some, some people might want to do this. And so everybody has different software that they want to run. And each category of software, you know, has, you know, if it's APM, call it 20 different vendors, right? Um, or, or open source solutions. And so not everybody picks the same thing. And so you still pick uh, individually for your organization what you guys want to use. That's up to you. Um, we make no opinions on that. Uh, so, so it's, it's, it's really up to your organization, what you want to use. And yes, you bundle in just the same way you would pick and choose for Kubernetes or Linux or any of the other options. Uh, Richard asks, how could I run nano VMs, really raspberry Pi or similar servers I would like to use for embedded systems. All right. So good news is that, uh, nanos does run on the raspberry Pi four. Um, we threw in support, uh, Mm, sometime last year for that, I think. And so it's, uh, you know, in our view, um, devices like the RFI4 and devices coming down the line after them, those are going to get more and more powerful, uh, you know, throughout the years. They're going to have a lot more resources. They're um, obviously, they're going to continue to shrink. Uh, price points are going to come down. I think, I don't know, when we were looking at it, you could get one for 20 or 30 bucks. Um, I'm, I'm sure that's changed now. And so, you know, the RPI4 in particular was really interesting. Why? Because then we could use ARM V8. Uh, and what um, V8 actually gave us was uh, a couple different new um, instructions that allowed virtualization to actually be worth the crap on the device. If you were using like a V6 or something like that, virtualization just was, it was, it was too, it was too crappy to use on a device like that. But with, with V8, um, uh, those devices now are uh, sufficiently good uh, to, to use and, and they're gonna get a lot better too. So you could imagine like, say you, have, say you have a camera in a parking lot that looks at license plates um, and, or, or you count the number of cars coming in and uh, coming from the, uh, the parking lot using like an open CV or something. So you could envision, you could have one unikernel um, taking screenshots through a USB camera, right? Through FFmpeg or something like that. So that's one unikernel. Another one is, uh, is using you know, an, an inference framework uh, attached to a Intel TPU or whatever. Um, and, and that's one unikernel. And then you have another one uh, that does kind of the reporting roll up and it ships it off to the cloud. So you have like three apps all on that same device. And uh, what's great about it is, is that USB camera, say I compromise that somehow, uh, um, well, I'm not automatically given access to, to that uh, you know, Intel offloading processor um, because there's that virtualization separation, right? 
now I have to bust through the host somehow. And that's, that's uh, become significantly more difficult. Um, and so, so yeah, I, especially at scale, as, as those edge devices will go, um, I, can, I can see unikernels being hugely, hugely um, productive there. Uh, just to be clear, when we're putting these things on RFIs and things like that, we're not considering talking about flashing the device. Uh, Nanos in particular never gets flashed to actual real bare metal. It's always, always provisioned as a VM. And the reason why is because of the architecture. We can do stuff like no users and single app VMs and stuff like that because it's virtualized. We would not be able to do that if it was actually on real bare, bare metal. Um, so Vinay asks, what program language does Unikernel support? So um, basically there's, there's two types of uh, Unikernels out there and, and there's like over 10 different implementations. Um, one type is, is uh, kind of language specific. So if you look at like HalVM or Mirage or any of those, you know, they're, they're all focused on single languages be, be, because what they're, you know, they have different focuses. And that's another thing that you'll, you'll run into Unicron projects is so they're all over the place. Some are interested in security, some are interested in performance, some are interested in NFB, 5G. So they're all over the place. Um, but, uh, but what we say is like, there's kind of POSIX quote, POSIX compliant ones, and then non. And so, um, you know, OSB and Rump Run and Nanos and um, projects like that, those are all in what we call the, uh, the kind of POSIX compatible camp. And essentially we don't care. Like you give us an ELF, which is the Linux binary format. And that's, that's all we really need. Um, so to answer, that's a very long winded way of saying uh, we don't care what language it is. Um, you get different capabilities. Obviously, if you're using something like Go or Rust or Java, something that has access to native threads, um, scaling uh, especially can be different because you know with with Go, you know even even a small G1 small uh, can just take massive amounts of traffic, uh, and so you can pay like five bucks a month or whatever the cost is, and you you don't really have to worry at all about scale. Um, if you're using like a Ruby, a Node, a Python, you know, one of the scripting languages, those are inherently single process, single thread uh, to begin with, because, uh, you know, in Ruby, I can, I can write a class called dog. It could be 2000 lines and in one fell swoop, I can, I can, you know, cast it to the edge or 42. Um, so that's, that's an interesting thing you can do in those languages, right? But um, that, that pre presents problems when you're trying to scale. And that's why those languages are inherently single process, single thread. Um, and so you, you, you do it the same way you do it normally where you have a load balancer or a reverse proxy and you stick as many workers behind it as you want. Um, in the case of unikernels, those workers obviously become uh, VMs. And so that's, that's how you can uh, go about doing that. Uh, Janice asks, uh, I'm curious about it's possible to apply nested virtualization nano environment. Um, yeah, it, it is. So uh, Google has nested vert and Amazon has what they, they call a uh, quote bare metal. It's, it's not really bare metal, um, but, but they've made it to where you can actually run your own virtualized workloads in their environment. Um, uh, so, so yeah, this is, this is a case like where you want to own all the infrastructure, as I was talking about earlier. If you want to set up the bridges and you want to set up the taps and, and you want to control all that infrastructure, that's how you would go about doing that in, in the cloud. Um, but yeah, there's another question there, but I, I, I didn't quite see it before it went away. Um, yeah, oh, okay, yeah. Um, Carmen asks, if you want to do some profiling, what are the tools we can use? Uh, so there's lots of different ways to profile uh, depending on um, what exactly uh, you're interested in. Uh, it, you know, I, I showed you kind of the S-Trace Lite um, tool that we have. Uh, that's, that's really more about finding out uh, what the program is actually calling out, uh, it, it, you know, through like libc and so forth. Um, but we also have uh, F-Trace, which, which kind of will give you the more, uh, you know, find out what my CPU is actually doing and, and what frame and all that. And you can create flame graphs and all that good stuff. 
um, you know, in terms of APM agents, like I said, uh, Prometheus and all that sort of stuff, you can export whatever you want, whether it's heap metrics or CPU metrics or, you know, all that good stuff. If you're looking to do more benchmarking in terms of like networking, there's iPerf and, um, you know, IOSTAT for disk and uh, all that good stuff. So, um, yeah, it, pr pretty much all your same tools kind of work. What it really, what, what, what the real difference is, is that, no, you're not going to SSH into production and start profiling a production instance uh, like that. Um, you can obviously include a framework that will allow you to take sampling and things like that. Um, but again, that's not really something that we would recommend most people really do. Um, I, I, I mentioned earlier where you could, you could take a clone of a running VM download that clone and then attach and check it out. Um, and that's, that's something else uh, that, that, that we would encourage people to do. And then uh, I guess uh, Nikati uh, from the chat box asked, uh, new to this topic, I may be asking a wrong question. Is it only for Golink? Can I do for Python apps? Uh, yeah. So, so, um, we answered this uh, in a different way uh, a few questions ago, but but essentially we don't care um, what language you're using because uh, uh, we we basically load up L binaries and so yeah you can do Python and and we we have a few uh, packages available Python wise on on the public repo page but if you see something that's missing or you need something more customized I mean we're happy to work with and you know provide you a more custom package uh obviously anybody can upload their own packages as well to to the public repo um that's uh you know free and easy to to access so. awesome thanks ian for that um ton of questions that was great sure and uh thanks everybody for the questions um and actually pretty perfect on time um we're just like th three minutes shy so yeah um ian if people want more um where can they find you uh yeah let me just type in three quick links to uh to the chat so the tool that i was showing was ops.city the the kernel itself is nanos.org. Both of these have GitHubs. They're Apache too, meaning we don't really care what you do. And we're not really afraid of Google or Amazon doing anything either. So, um, so ops nanos. And then the third one is the repo, uh, repo.opsity. And so those uh, have quite a few pre-made packages. Again, you know, you can create your own package, upload it, um, or you can, you know, ask us and we can try and work with you. And, get something made too. So. Awesome. And I'll make sure that I include this links in the follow-up email so you'll all get it. Cool. Ian, thank you so much for doing this, man. For sure. Um, and thanks everyone for, for joining for the questions. Great session. See awesome. you the next one. All right. Thanks See Ian. you guys. Bye-bye.